What comes to mind when you hear the word discipline? Perhaps you think of being reprimanded or punished. Perhaps you think of being forced to give up something or take on a tedious, challenging task. Hopefully, you also think about the great value in taking a disciplined approach to some aspect of your life or your work or your home. The payoff and reward that comes from an intense level of training, focus, sacrifice, determination, and hard work. Whatever associations you have, one of the things Jesus revealed is God's heart for us to be people characterized by discipline. This is why his earliest followers were referred to as disciples. Discipline is crucial in every area of our lives and every area of society. Our relationships, our jobs, our finances, our diets, our institutions, we all need discipline. Our lives and our world thrive with discipline and fall apart without it. And the Bible has so much to teach us about how to live more disciplined lives. Together, let's be attentive over the next several weeks to how God's Word might help us solve our discipline problem. It's not surprising to me that you don't want to talk about discipline. I don't want to talk about discipline. Can you imagine trying to be in my shoes today? You stand in front of a congregation trying to get them excited about talking about discipline? It's an uphill battle. The Bible says something similar to this in Hebrews 12. We've talked about this verse a couple times already. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. A paraphrase of that, the, the section below it is the message version, which says, God is doing what's best for us, training us to live God's holy best. At the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off big time, for it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. This morning, my goal is to help you become well-trained, for you to grow in your maturity, and I know you don't want it. On Tuesday morning, I woke up to my alarm. I'd chosen that time the night before, but when it went off, I thought, really? because no discipline is pleasant at the time. And then I put on some running clothes and some running shoes and went for a run that morning before work, but the hills seemed steeper. The body ached more because no discipline seems pleasant at the time. And then I came inside and by this time most of the kids were up and it was time for breakfast and oatmeal with berries or granola, that would be good. But Lucky Charms looked really, really good. Because no discipline seems pleasant at the time. And then we got the kids off to school and on to buses. And I got to my office and opened up my laptop for the second time that day and looked at a long list of emails and a really big to-do list and some conversations I wasn't looking forward to. And I thought, maybe there's a different job that doesn't require all of this. Because no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Some of you had to practice discipline this morning to get up on time, to get dressed, to get here. Some are watching online because they didn't quite pull it off in time. Some of you got in some family conflict on your way to church this morning. I know it happened, okay? I've been avoiding that for 10 years. That's why I'm here early. And some of you needed to get to the third song before you could pass the peace to your family and get along again because it's been difficult. I want to talk about it. I want to talk about discipline from the perspective of family, the disciplined family. I know as I say that a bunch of you don't have young kids anymore, and some of you never had kids, and some of you have different systems. But what I want you to think about is even if what I'm saying to you doesn't apply to the people you're instructing that are smaller than you, your children, you yourself were once a child, and you were disciplined by your parents or guided by your parents, and it was that discipline that helped you, or it was the lack of discipline or the poorly done discipline that you're still trying to recover from. Discipline applies to all of us in all of our situations. So I want to start with just a question. You can just raise your hand and shout out some answers. It's a simple one. What is it that children need? 
What do you think are the big things that children need? Give me a word. What do you got? They need love. Parents. Food. Sleep. My kids need more sleep. Okay? There's a bunch of kind of basic things that come right up, and you would add a long list of them. Well, today I want to share with you what I think the scripture says kids need. I'm not going to cover all of it. We don't have that much time, but I want to come up with five things. If you're writing notes or using the church app, write some notes down because these are things that come right from the scripture that's really helpful for what kids need. Again, if you don't have kids, it doesn't mean this doesn't apply to you because there's actually some really great learning you can do because it's also about you. Okay, the first thing that kids need is what we might call the basics. It's provision, right? They need the basics of life. So the text for this is 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. It says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, the people who share a house with them, has denied their faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Talk about a critical text there. If you don't provide for the people in your house, if you don't make sure there's food on the table and a roof over top, if you don't do what you can, and I know sometimes you can't control everything, but if you don't provide for them, it's as if you were an unbeliever. So what do kids need? They need basics like food and water and warmth and shelter and clothes. All those things are universal. In fact, if they fail to provide that, there's a word for that. It's called neglect. And our government has rightly determined if a child is neglected, the state will take that child into what's called protective custody. Because what happens to a child who's neglected for years? It's not good, is it? That child's gonna have long-term psychological, physical, and emotional consequences if they're neglected. It's important for a kid to have those basics. But the Bible says, yes, they need those basics, but it goes beyond that. It's more than that. Providing for someone else requires being selfless. Well, where would we get this idea of selfless love? Can anybody figure that out? Who is really good at selfless love? God, right? God is selfless in his love for us. So if we're going to be Christians and provide selfless love, we're going to take care and look out for the needs of others. If we don't do that, it's like we're an unbeliever. Now, parents, you've heard me say that, and a bunch of you are already feeling guilt. Well, okay, we're trying our best to provide everything for our kids. Let me make something really, really clear. Listen to what the Bible doesn't say. The Bible does not say that parents are supposed to provide a luxurious life for their kids. It doesn't say we're supposed to provide every amenity possible for our kids. It's not say we're supposed to provide an easy life for our kids. The irony is that when we chase the big life, the life of the big house and the nice stuff and the schedule that goes nonstop and the best clothes and the top of the line backyard and the second home and all the extras, we actually risk losing the most important things. Like Jesus says, you might gain the whole world for your kids, yet lose them in all the ways that actually matter. Parents, I want to say this really clear to you, especially the parents who are in this room, don't give your kids everything they want. Give them the things that they need. And there's a huge difference. Pay attention to that. The second thing kids need is direction. It's a really famous verse on parenting. It's Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, start children off the way they should go. And even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Start them in the right direction. You might see I have some props here with me. This bike right here is the bike we taught all four of our kids how to ride on. It's called a balance bike. It doesn't even have pedals on it. You know how it works when they start, right? They, come here, Junior, sit in the seat. Okay, we hunch down, one hand on the handlebar, one hand behind the seat, and we push, we guide, we point them in the right direction. If I start junior on the seat and we're leaning to the left, what's going to happen? They're going to fall to the left. If I lean them to the right, they're going to, it's important to put them on the right path. I have a cute little video to share you of one of us teaching one of our kids to ride bikes. This is 10 years old.
Good job, Peanut. Pay attention to the details of it. The right position, getting them in alignment, that's on the parkway next to our house, right? We start the child on the way they should go, but after a while, it's tough for me to keep up, right? And now they're on their own and we veer off. Parenting is over and over and coming next to them, grabbing them by the handlebar and by the seat and guiding them, hoping to put them in the right direction. 10 years later, the bike's gotten a little bit bigger, hasn't it? I can't keep up. It's a much more complex bike. The, the routes they go are going to be different. They're now on their own. But if I didn't do the work at the beginning of guiding them, they can't do it by themselves later. The point I want to make is this. The childhood home is the practice field for the rest of their life. Those are the years where they get to practice before it becomes their own game to play. In your home, your children will learn communication, sharing, responsibility, conflict management, play, rest, work ethic, or they won't learn any of those things. But it's up to you what happens in that home. When they're young and small, I'm in charge, right? I can keep them, I can hold them up. As they get older, I have less and less control. Now that verse you just heard brought some of you a bunch of guilt and shame because you've raised your kids and now they're adults and they haven't gone the way you wanted to and you feel bad about that. You feel anger and frustration. You might even say, Chad, I did everything right. We brought our kids to church a lot. We tried to teach them the right way, but they're going the other direction. No matter how good your parenting is, you cannot overcome another person's free will. Our obedience, sorry, our, our obedience is our own responsibility. Discipline is a choice we choose again and again to set them up to succeed. But if we don't even put them on the right path, it's even more unlikely they will stick with it. I think the bike analogy helps a bunch for those who've struggled to watch your kids grow up. You can't control them anymore. Eventually it becomes their choice about what they do. So what do they do? It occurs to me that a lot of people are pointing their kids in the wrong direction. A lot of people are pointing them to chase other things that are good things. They're just not the most important things. Here's a couple key examples. Money. Acquiring a lot of money. Or getting a lot of stuff. How many kids graduate from high school and they go to get the degree at college that they think is going to pay them a lot, a lot of money. That's what I want to get. I want a job that pays me a lot. Or we're going to push our kids down the avenue of sports. And I love sports probably more than most. I think it's really great. Sports are good, but if we sacrifice everything, quality time as a family, Sundays in church, discipline in all the other ways, they might gain a good sports career for a few years. They might even be good enough to get a scholarship in college, but they might have lost the most important things. Stuff. I want to get a bunch of stuff. And so it seems like parents are pointing kids in the wrong direction rather than pointing them in the direction that matters most. My wife shared a troubling statistic with me this week. I think she got it from Facebook, so it might not be real. <laughs> she said to me, Chad, I, I heard or read that of all the time I will get to spend with my kids in my entire lifetime, 70% of it will be done by the time they turn 12. See, when they're young, you have control. You get to guide them. They can't drive. They can't leave. They go where you go. They do what you do. As they get older, you have less and less influence over what they choose to do, which is really important and also really troubling that so many of us don't take that really seriously. We don't consider it. It, it blows my mind when I hear parents say, and I heard this a lot, especially the church I served in New Jersey before I came here nine years ago. I hear parents say, you know what? We're going we're gonna to bring our kids to church till they're like, eight or nine, and then we're going to let them choose if they want to go to church. I remember being eight or nine years old, okay? Do you remember? Did you want to go to church a lot? I mean, this is a great church. I probably would have wanted to come to this church, okay? It's a discipline. Are we guiding them in the right path, or are we saying, you know what, you choose. Whatever feels good or feels comfortable or feels easy, 
You have a responsibility to parent, especially in those early years. But then if you give up because it's hard in middle school or high school, that's one of the most foolish things I encounter as a pastor. When is the time in your child's life when they need the church the most? I think it might be middle school and high school and, and, and college and those early adult years. This is where they need a community, where they need relationships, where they need accountability. And if we pull them back, we're foolishly pulling them back from the thing they need most. Okay, third thing that the kids need is real life examples. The text here is Deuteronomy 6. This is one of the most famous texts in the whole Old Testament. It's called the Shema to, in, in, in Hebrew. And it says this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commands I give to you are to be on your hearts, the center of you. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I want to highlight some key words in this text, okay? It's going to break down intentionally. The first word that comes up in the text is the word love. What sets Christianity apart from all the other religions in the world is that your God asks for love from you. Before anything else, before sacrifice, before time, before money, before anything else, God wants your love. We love because God first loved us. It's a different type of religion. Love the Lord your God with all of yourself, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. Not just the spare parts, not just the little pieces, not the convenient aspects of us, but all all of you, all of, all of you, all of it belongs to God. This is what you're supposed to do. What's really interesting is this instruction is written to the household leaders, to the parents or to the grandparents. This isn't about talking to kids yet, it's actually talking to the adults. Your job, adults in the room, is to love the Lord your God. How? With all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. This is your job. If you're an adult who considers himself to be a Christian in the presence of other people, your job is to be responsible for yourself. Make sense? I got a little preachy there. Sorry about that. If you do that, if you love the Lord your God with all of yourself, then now you're ready to help someone else. It has to start with you. Too many people are trying to teach their kids faith that they're not practicing. Let me say that again. Too many people are trying to teach their kids a faith that they're not practicing. If you do that, then you're ready to go to the rest, which is this consistent training. Kids need consistent training. So the scripture says, impress this on your children. It doesn't mean beat it into them. Impress is more like a stamp. It leaves a mark. It says this is where it comes from. It's the way you give something to someone. How do you impress it? The scripture says you talk about it. You talk about it when you wake up. You talk about when you go to sleep. You talk about when you're on the road. You talk about when you sit down for a meal. You talk about things. I have a great example of that in a second. The second thing it says is tie it. Wear it like a bracelet. Okay, bind it on your forehead. Jews, Hasidic Jews, wear a little box on their head that has a little teeny example of the the Hebrew scriptures inside the box. Have you ever seen anybody with this? It's called a totifot. Okay, I'd take you to a Hasidic community in Northwest, or or, sorry, in uh, New York City. It'd be really interesting for you to watch. They believe they literally were supposed to bind it on their heads and then write it on their doorpost. If you go to a Hasidic Jew's home, it's written outside their door. They took that completely literally. Here's some other ways to think about it, okay? God gave my wife and I four kids to raise. What's interesting to me is that my kids love the Chicago Cubs. They love hiking. They love water skiing. They love going to the beach. They love playing board games. They love watching American Ninja Warrior, and they love deep dish pizza. Do you know why they love all those things? Because I love those things, okay? They don't have a choice. But they also love those things because we talk about those things. We look forward. Tonight we're having deep dish pizza. Let's watch the game together. Let's do these things. It becomes part of who we are. That whole bit about, I would never bind something to my forehead. Well, would you wear a baseball cap with your favorite team on it? You better believe you would. That's how our kids learn the faith. If you love the thing, they will love the thing. Love is contagious. So do you love the Lord your God? 
Do you love them with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? If you do, there's a better chance your kids are going to. See, Christian families aren't an accident. They come from consistent examples and consistent training. I've shared this statistic before. I'll share it again. It's one of the most compelling and, 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 and uh, convicting stats you're going to hear, especially if you're a parent. The data has come back, well-researched, thousands of students surveyed. The number one indicator of a child's future faith is the present faith of their parents. So if you want your kid to be a Christian in 20 years, If you want your kid to go to church in 20 years, to be generous in 20 years, to serve others in 20 years, right now, are you going to church? Are you being generous? Are you serving others? Are you being kind? Almost every Christian parent that I know that goes to church really wants that for their kids, but they forget that it starts with them. Here's another interesting data point. I've shared this one before too. They figured out that if kids can identify five adults in their life who are Christians, who they have a strong, positive relationship with, they're much more likely to stick with the faith. It's called sticky faith. And so this is what it should look like. Every one of my kids, I should have an index card with five slots in it. Ideally, it starts like this, that dad is a positive spiritual influence and mom is a spiritual influence. If that's so, you're looking for at least three more spots. And you better believe I'm going to work really hard to find three more spots filled in, that my kid has a great relationship with some other adult. Why do you think Christ Community puts so much time, energy, and resources into youth ministry? Because we want to fill those three spots for every single kid. Now, some of you say, well, I'm at a disadvantage. I'm a spiritual widow. That means I'm the only one in my household who brings their kids toward faith. My husband doesn't believe, or my wife doesn't believe, or I'm a single parent. Okay, great. You got four spots to fill. We're here to help. But don't settle for a kid who's going to graduate from high school and has only one or two spots filled. It's your responsibility as a parent to make sure that they're encountering this. One of the other ways we do that at Christ Community Church is we emphasize small groups. Why? Well, it's really good for parents. It's also really good for kids to see their parents growing in faith. If a kid's going to grow, they need to see their parents grow, and they're going to interact with a bunch of adults that their parents are also interacting with. We want to encourage that. Okay, I've covered a lot so far. We've covered provision, direction, uh, consistent examples and training. Here's the last one. It's the one you know is coming, the one you know you need but you don't like. Kids need discipline. The reason we invented or created this whole series was because of this truth. We continue to encounter in children's ministry and youth ministry, and especially as we reach out into the community, so many kids who lack the discipline that's going to set them up to thrive. Kids need careful discipline. Here's the scripture, and it's one that's often misquoted. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. It's not from Deuteronomy 6. I wrote that wrong. It's Proverbs 13, verse 24, but the verse is still right. Whoever spares the rod hates their children. That's a strong word, isn't it? Maybe it makes you uncomfortable to read that. It makes me uncomfortable to study it. Let me walk you through a little bit more of that. I don't know a parent who would raise their hand and say, yep, I hate my kids. Okay? I might be frustrated with my kids. I might have lost my cool but I love my kids. I want the best for them. The Bible does not, in this verse, let me say this incredibly clearly, the Bible does not support or condone child abuse. Anyone who argues for it is not reading the Bible faithfully. The rod in the ancient world was not a symbol of punishment. It was a symbol of discipline, a guide, something to help keep kids on the right path. So here's a better paraphrase that you might find a little bit easier to understand. When you ignore discipline, you stunt your child's growth. Or a refusal to correct is really a refusal to love. Or whoever forgets discipline hates their children by not providing for them. You see, discipline is not a sign of hate or anger. It's actually a sign of love. If you really care, you'll prepare them for life. 
Here's some examples of this. If we pulled the teachers in our room, we have a lot of teachers at Christ Community Church. If I said to the teachers, describe to me what happens when a child is undisciplined, they'll tell you about a kid in the classroom that's disruptive, that struggles to learn, that can't get along with other people, and is behind in almost all of their work. If I ask a coach, tell me about an undisciplined athlete on your team, they'll scratch their head and say how frustrated they are and how disruptive they are to the team. If I ask the employers in the room, tell me about your undisciplined staff or undisciplined employees. If I ask a spouse, tell me about what happens when there's an undisciplined spouse. They go through the pain that that's caused them. We all know it's true. We want discipline. We need discipline. We just don't like it. Think about it as if there's a road with two ditches, a path that leads toward health and ditches on both sides. On one ditch that we have to acknowledge is reckless, destructive discipline. The parents who yell but don't instruct. The child who's abused physically, emotionally, who fears the rage of their parents, who's told to be be good in public but in private is screamed at day after day. The child who grows up with an alcoholic or an abusive parent with a rage-filled parents, that child will grow up to be cold, they will struggle to give love, and they will struggle to receive love. That's one ditch. On the other ditch is the new type of parenting we encounter in this culture of soft parenting or helicopter parenting or snowplow parenting. Snowplow parenting, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, is where we clear out the path so it's just really easy for our kids. The parents work hard, but the kids don't have to work at all. We provide everything for them. But in this ditch, you unintentionally sabotage their future. You work really hard to give them everything they need, but not what they need most. So we want to be their friends and not their parents. We want them to like us, but they never respect us. These kids never learn what no sounds like. What I want you to see is there's a disaster on both ditches. If you abuse your kids, they're going to struggle If you give them everything they want, they're going to struggle. What word we've missed in the text when people interpret this is the word careful. The one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Is the abusive parent careful? Not at all. They're out of control. Is the soft parent careful? No, they're not disciplined themselves. Discipline is being attentive and careful. There's some times, parents, where you're really frustrated with your kids. You need to put yourself in timeout when you put your kids in timeout because you're not careful. There's some times where you need to think more about what you're going to do or say before you meet the moment where your kid needs their guidance most. The greatest gift you can give your kids is limits. Discipline that keeps them on the right track. Discipline requires a carefulness. You can't be reckless or lazy. Let me come back to what we said at the beginning. No one likes discipline at the time. No one. But later on, the payoff is big time. You won't regret loving, careful discipline. So to all the parents and grandparents in the room, to all of us who grew up in homes, let's remember what a kid needs is also what an adult needs. Let's go through the list one more time. You need, and so does every kid, daily provision, godly direction, mature examples, consistent training, and careful discipline. It strikes me that no one was better at this than Jesus himself. That's the model we follow. We try to parent like Jesus would parent our kids. We try to love our family like God would love our family. We submit to discipline because Christ himself did all of those things. So I want to encourage you and pray for you as you continue to go forward in these ways. Don't give up on discipline, for it is the path toward God's beautiful future. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for this church and for its people. Thank you for setting us up with leaders in kids' ministry and youth ministry, for people in small groups and friendships that get formed over a long period of time. We need your help, God, to do the right things. Do it well over and over again. We pray for parents who are easily overwhelmed and discouraged, for parents who are tired, for parents who want to give up and don't feel like they have resources. I pray that you would surround them, that they would commit to community and relationships, to church, to friendships, that they would be vulnerable and in practicing vulnerability, they might find people to walk with, to learn from. 
I pray for kids who don't have five adults in their life they can look up to, especially our middle school and high school students. I pray that they might find him, that they might seek them, that they might find mentors that they walk with and coach them for years and years to come. And Lord, I pray that you would be with us as a church, that we would not shrink back from the tasks, but we would step forward, that we would be courageous in loving every single child you bring into our community. Help us, God, to be people who lead by example, who have character at the beginning and end of every day. Give us wisdom, God, to be your people. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm gonna bring up two people with me here. It's Jess and Jory. You found them too, didn't you, Jess? I wanna dismiss our third through fifth graders. They're gonna go to Junction 35. I brought Jess and Jory up front. They lead different aspects of our ministry to kids. See you later, guys. Since this applies to the family specifically, we want to spend a little bit of time kind of breaking down what you just heard and some encouragement specifically to you is how we do this as a church. And so the first question, I'm going to start with you, Jess, and then we'll go to Jory. What was something today that you heard that you would emphasize to the congregation? For me, the thing that you said um, that I would emphasize is that Once our kids grow up, when you said that we no longer have control over them, quite honestly, I would say by the time my kids got into high school, freshman year, the control was harder and harder. But you also said that what we do, how we practice our faith, that is how they'll still see that. It's still an example. So while we can't control them, we have a tremendous amount of influence on them just by how we live out our lives and our faith. Yeah, movement from control toward influence is, is maturing as a parent. I like that. That's great. Troy, what for you would you point out? Um, something that stood out to me is I think our end goal is not perfection um, in parenting or uh, as a family. Um, so I think that's something that we really, need, especially me, because I love control and I really would love to be perfect, so I think that's something that... Um, I don't think anybody else can relate to that here, Jory. Um, so I think that's really something that I need to remember as a, as a parent and for my family is, like, it's not about perfection, mm. and it's okay to make mistakes, but we need to learn from those. Um, the other thing that stood out to me was um, how I think that we could so easily bring our kids into our disciplines that we already have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, do you have an example of that? I do. Um, so when I was younger, um, my mom would pray with me daily. Um, I'm sorry. Prayer is like a really super um, vulnerable thing, and it's something that I hold really dear to me. And um, so my mom would pray with me daily. And I remember thinking um, during that prayer time, like there was just such a peace and comfort that came over. Um, and I'm not a super disciplined person. The word discipline and the word budget scares me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, those words. So I, my husband is like super disciplined in like all areas of his life. And the one area that I feel like I've always been really disciplined in is my prayer life. Um, and that's why I get super emotional because I feel like it's a very sacred, um, emotional, personal, vulnerable thing. And so I've always had a really strong prayer life. Um, and so what I did with my, in my, um, my discipline of my prayer is I passed it on to my children. And so I invited them and I brought them into my practice of that we pray. I pray over my children every day before they leave for school. And it's something that I did because it's hard as a parent. It's hard being a parent and it's hard to send our kids out every day into the world. So we pray. And as you know, parents in the morning, um, it's a little crazy to get our kids off to school on time. And my kids know no matter if we're running late, if lunches aren't packed, we take time to pray. And we do that because we made that a priority. And I've, it's been a huge blessing in my life to pray with my children. And it's been a huge blessing in their life because there'll be times when they know something's going on in school, a test or whatever, and they ask me, Mom, can you pray for this today? And um, so it's been a, a a huge um, blessing in our life. Love that. All right, anything you want to add on that maybe I didn't cover well this morning or extras? Well, maybe Jory and I should have talked about this because that was actually what I was going to say too when you had asked us what we would share um, a tip from our own lives. I would say that I didn't start early. I didn't have that 
example at home. And so what, um, when I started with the kids praying, and I agree that it's probably one of the most important things you can do, um, is teach your kids it's not fancy, and you don't have to sound elegant. You just, it's just a conversation with God, with somebody you love. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, God, I need help. We need help here. Yeah. And we started probably, our kids were already either in middle school or high school, and every night we do it. And they all pile onto my bed, and yes, I still make them do this. And they're 22, 20, and and 16 now, and now they hate me for saying this, but, um, <laughs> and we just share something that we are grateful for that happened that day and something that we need prayer for. And then we take turns each night. One of us prays over the whole family then. Yeah. Um, and it's been something that I hope that they can take with them, um, in their lives with their families Absolutely. next. Joy, anything you want to add on? Um, I think I, I covered everything. Um, one of the things I know that would talk, go back to our perfection and um, for families and parenting is I think something I also would offer is the importance of just a real family discussion. Mm. Um, what's going wrong? What's going right? Um, how are relationships going? How do you need to be loved? How can we love others? And I think just having those real conversations yep. um, has been um, a thing that we really do in our family. I can think of I'm, dozens of conversations I've had with individuals in this congregation who are a couple steps ahead of my family in our season of life. And where they'll say something, I'm like, oh, that's really good. I'm going to write that down. Oh, we're going to try that practice at home. We're going to do something like that. And so I, I've been stealing uh, from you for years. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but I would really encourage you, find people to walk with. Find somebody who's got a family system that looks a little bit like yours. Maybe you find yourself divorced. Find a good divorced person who's also where you're at, and as a couple steps, learn from them. Find somebody else who's parenting kids who are young adults. Learn from them. Learn from people and learn together because that's the gift of community. Um, and keep that work up. Wonderful. Thank you. As you can tell, we have a great team here. If you have any questions about kids ministry, youth ministry, they're here to help you. We're here to walk with all of you.